Hey everybody, welcome back to my YouTube channel. This past summer I tried a couple feature length videos just to get my feet wet in this medium and I focused on science and technology topics that are interesting to me. I want to take a little bit of a different approach now. I want to stick with the science and technology angle but I want to do it as part of a progressive model building exercise. For the background of what I'm going to do, Colorado, where I live, experienced a gold rush in 1859 that started about 10 years after California's gold rush and then in 1879 there was also a silver rush. The silver rush bottomed out later with a panic and a lot of the mines went bankrupt and closed. Gold however came back for a short time during the depression because people looking to invest in something more solid than a terrible economy were buying it. To give you an idea as a background, why would people be looking for gold and silver in Colorado? Well, the geology of the Colorado Rockies includes a large belt known as the Colorado Mineral Belt. It runs from the northeast edge of the Rockies down to an area in the southwest. On the northeast side, it's Boulder, Colorado, roughly, and that's where the mines really begin. And then on the southwest side is roughly in the La Plata Mountains. And a good chunk of that, just for reference, actually follows the Continental Divide, which makes kind of a little hook back through Colorado. So right along that formation of the Rockies, there are a lot of metal-bearing ores. Gold, silver, lead, zinc, not copper so much. You have to go to Arizona or New Mexico to find copper mines. But those four in particular, and a few others, molybdenum, and I don't know, there might be one or two more. But those were the principal metals that were mined, and gold and silver played a very important role, not only in the formation of Colorado as a separate territory and then a state, but also in the state's history and economic development. Denver, Colorado in particular, was built heavily around smelter and other industrial operations that supported the mines. Okay, you can still see the legacy of that, of course, today. Uh, you drive up the I-70 corridor, back then it was US-40, but you drive up the I-70 corridor, uh, you go into the mountains about 15-20 minutes later, if traffic is good, you end up in Idaho Springs, then you continue on to Georgetown, and then you continue on up over the Continental Divide by either going over Loveland Pass or through the Eisenhower and Johnson Tunnels. Beyond that, you get to Breckenridge and a few other areas uh, farther back. And all those areas uh, were very heavily invested in mining. In fact, you don't even have to go up onto the side roads to see it. If you're driving the I-70 corridor, as soon as you start to get close to Idaho Springs and then beyond it, there's tailings piles up left, up left and right in the canyon. And there's even a few larger mining works still surrounding Idaho Springs. One of those is, was one of the largest in the world at its time, the Argo Mill. That's still standing in Idaho Springs. It's been preserved as a uh, legacy and museum. You can take tours of it, and hopefully we'll get a chance to review what's still available to see inside that one as kind of a prequel to the Santiago Mill, which is the one I want to focus on in this series. To give you an idea of the impact of mining on the landscape, take a look at this Google Earth satellite imagery uh, from around Central City and Blackhawk. Central City and Blackhawk are just a little bit northeast of Idaho Springs and a fair bit southwest of Boulder. All those bright yellow piles that you can see, the dozens upon dozens of them, are mine tailing piles. And if you can see a mine tailing pile at this altitude, uh, you're looking at at least a couple acres of, of tailings, if not more. We can zoom in on you know, one of the larger ones here and you can see that there's a pretty substantial pit there. And others of these mines, if they didn't dig around the surface, they went straight down. They, followed, you know, they found a productive area and just kept going down and down, thousands of feet in some cases. In any case, the Santiago Mill is what I want to focus on. The Santiago Mill is actually located a bit uh, south and west of Georgetown, Colorado. Georgetown is up the I-70 corridor from Idaho Springs a little ways. And what I want to do is actually model that mill. To give you an idea, 
of why I'm interested. I went to the Colorado School of Mines, which was a school founded upon mining engineering in the 1800s, and I went for electrical engineering. So all my career up to this point has been involved mainly in electrical aspects. And the only reason I really ever first paid attention to the Santiago mill while out doing four wheel trips is because there was a power line going up to it. Oh, electricity, that's neat. But as I've looked more into Colorado's mining history, I've become really curious. What is the process? What is the science and technology that you use to extract a very small amount of what you want from a very large amount that just ends up in the tailings pile? Okay, Santiago Mill, let's focus on that because that's what this series is gonna be about. If you exit the backside of Georgetown, there's a paved road, it's one of Colorado's scenic byways and it's called the Guanella Pass Road. And again, it's paved, you can take it in a passenger vehicle, it's a lovely drive and there's a lot to see up in there including the upper and lower Cabin Creek Reservoirs, which as far as I know, is Colorado's only pumped hydro station. It's run by Excel and it's only a few megawatts, I think. But in any case, you can see that, it's right there off the road. However, before you go that far, there's a turnoff for the Leavenworth Creek Road, or Colorado 352 on the map. It's not marked at all anymore. Apparently in the olden days it was marked as Waldorf this way. But it's a four-wheel drive trail. It's badly washed out. You don't want to be taking any passenger vehicle on it. You don't even want to be taking a Subaru, as far as I can tell. And again, it's important not to go up on 4x4 four four trails in a vehicle that isn't equipped, because it's a narrow trail. If you get stuck, it's possible you're going to trap people up there for hours. But if you have a proper 4x4, four four, uh, you know, like a Jeep Cherokee or almost any body-on-frame vehicle with four-wheel drive, you can go up that road. And about five miles up, you get to the old Waldorf town site. At the Waldorf town site, there's nothing left standing now. Apparently, as recently as, I don't know, maybe 30 or 40 years ago, there were still a few buildings up. But it even had a post office for a short time, and its only purpose for being there is that there was a mine. And the Waldorf mine, you can still see the collapsed entrance to it. There's a acid mine drainage coming out of it yet. And there's the tailings pile that you can drive up on, and it's very broad and flat. You can park on it and look around. There's a lot of beautiful scenery. And there's a three-piston water pump sitting right there, and a distribution line and an old pipe just going up the hill. Where does that go to? You can't see it from down there. But if you follow the trails up the road then, you find at the terminus of both of those, the water pipe and the power line, is the Santiago Mill. The Santiago Mill was built in 1935, middle of the Depression when gold prices spiked briefly, and it operated until World War II. Uh, in late 1942, early 1943, the Government War Resources Board first issued and then enforced Order L-208, which said that gold mining was not essential to the war effort. If you want to continue mining, go mine copper. And so gold mines were shut down, and that mostly killed the gold mining industry in Colorado. There was some operations after that. There's only one mine operating today still producing gold. But in any case, the Santiago Mill, that wasn't the end of its story. After World War II, it was reopened by a resident of Georgetown, and it was operated to clear up until 1983. And as a result of that, in spite of the terrible weather at 10,000 feet, which is very, you know, involves very harsh winters, heavy snow loads, that kind of thing, it's still standing in fairly good condition. The mine itself was technically private property up until very recently. Um, you know, it's right there off the 4x4 trail, and for most of its life there was, you know, trespassing was not enforced on it. People just kind of wandered all over it. It was a novel curiosity. It's on the Colorado State Historical Register. People kind of wandered all over it and just looked at it because it's really neat. Here's this intact mine mill, and that in itself is unusual. Most of the remaining mills in Colorado of that size have since collapsed and been buried within my lifetime. But here's this intact mill, and if you go inside it, here's a bunch of equipment. There's still the crusher, the ball mill, um, sorting devices, and most interestingly, what was still a relatively new technology at that time, froth flotation. So they were using froth flotation, which is still used for some types of mining today, in order to extract mineral concentrate out of this huge pile of ore, most of which just ended up in the tailings pile. My oldest photos from four past four-wheel drive trips go back to roughly 2003, I think. But I went up there this fall, 2019, and discovered that within the past year, I think it was, the Forest Service had closed it off completely. The condition was deteriorating rapidly, 
and they wanted to preserve it as a historic artifact, along with a uh, local group in Georgetown called the Santiago Mill Stewards who'd taken an interest in it, I guess. And so they're working to try and preserve it. And in the meantime, it's closed. The tailings pile has been completely remediated due to arsenic, mercury, lead, and you know contaminants like that they found in it. And the original mine entrance is now also gone. I still have photos of that from when it was technically open. But the mill is still standing. And I went up there in 2019 thinking that'd be fun to take some video of it, do you know, almost like a little urbex exploration video, something like that, and found that it was closed and I was bummed. But then I got to thinking, you know, I've got these old photos of it. There's a lot of other old photos of it online. And there's a few YouTube videos as well. I think between all of these, I could work out the entire structure of it. The foundation, the walls, the equipment sizes and locations, and you know, starting from aerial photography, it's amazing that with Google Earth, if you look at it real closely and then just, you know, think about standard dimensions and building materials, you can pick off the dimensions anywhere that there's high resolution photography, and thankfully for this area there is, within a foot or two. I mean, if you do it a couple different times, try it at a couple different angles, use some common sense reasoning, and ideally if you have photos of the structure you're trying to model, yeah, you can get the overall footprint within a foot or two. And then from there, if you've got detailed photos of the interior, you can start working out the relationships of things one to another. And pretty soon, you can do a pretty good scale model. And so that's what I'm going to attempt to do. Um, due to standing standard building materials being, you know, two foot, four foot, eight foot, that kind of thing, I decided to try and build it at roughly two foot by four foot. The overall dimensions I came up with on the building were a little over 39 feet uh, in width and a little over 78 feet in length. And so I'm going to build that on a piece of two by four, two foot by four foot material. And it'll come out just slightly smaller than that. And the scale will be, I think around 0.6 inches equals one foot. So looking forward to that. Now understand it's not my goal to have like a woodworking or building or craft building channel kind of thing going here. I do want to show some of that process to keep it interesting. But what I'm really curious about is what is the science and technology of the equipment that was in that mine? When it was operating, what did it do and why? So along the way, I'm hoping to explore that, learn a bit more, and I hope you'll come along with me for the ride. Has anyone seen my phone?